Our Edwards, Nikki Rigo's running a version of the tutorial downstairs, which is substantially the same. Um, and this is getting started with Genie part one. Um, so there's three things we want to do here today. First is we want to do a very simple layer two experiment in Genie. Just the most basic, you know, this is the moral equivalent of Hello World. We're going to um, reserve two VMs and, uh, and we're going to do some, a little simple layer two experiment. So this is a hand-on exercise. This is intended to sort of be, you know, quick and easy and instant and gratification. Get your hands on, do your first experiment in Genie, your first hour in Genie. Second thing we want to do is we want to talk about a few terms. There's five Genie specific terms that um, we use a lot and we want to make sure that you understand what those mean. Nikki already talked about them a little bit in the last session, but we're going to define them again and we're going to use them so you get some hands-on experience with them. The third thing we want to do today is we're going to use a couple of Genie tools. In particular, we're going to use the Genie Experimenter Portal and a tool that's integrated with that called FLAC. All right, so that's three things that we're doing here today. All right, so um, we're going to, this experiment has three parts. You're going to see the same um, logo um, in various tutorials, and we're just sort of trying to provide a common roadmap. Part one is where you design and set up and configure um, things, and that includes a lot of the one-time setup stuff that you don't need to do for every experiment. The second part is the meat of an experiment. It's where you really do what you care about. And part three is where you do things like archive um, and uh, delete your resources so somebody else can use them. So you'll see this um, motif repeated in this tutorial and others today. Okay. So real quick, a little bit about the tools we're going to use. Um, first, uh, the Genie Portal. It's just a web-based tool for experimenters to manage three things. Um, experimenters which is um, projects and slices. And we're going to define those three things in a minute. And it also includes some simple tools for reserving resources. And we're integrating more and more all the time. Um, we've added several tools um, since the last GEC. And those are um, uh, going to be used in some later tutorials at GEC, which is really great. Um, the second uh, tool that we're using is called FLAC. And it's basically a graphical user interface for designing topologies and resor <coughs> reserving resources in Genie. And it's embedded in the portal. So you don't have to go find it and figure out how to log in. You log into the portal once, and it's going to take you um, to this other tool. You might not even think about it as a separate tool, which I think would be really good. OK. All right, so those are our two tools. And let's talk about um, our first couple of terms. So what's an experimenter? An experimenter is just a researcher who uses Genie resources. Different types of experimenters have different roles and different permissions, and those roles and permissions are reflected within the portal. So an advisor and their grad student won't have the same permissions um, and will be able to do slightly different things. The teacher of a class, their graduate student assistant, and, a, and an undergraduate taking that class would also all have different sort of roles and responsibilities that are reflected in the portal. And those are intended to help make um, using uh, Genie easier. So the, the second concept is a project. And projects are how you organize research in Genie. Um, it's basically just a label. But the important piece is that it contains both people and their experiments, and that there's a per one person, a single individual, the project lead, who's responsible for what happens in that project. So for example, the advisor of a graduate student would be the project lead, and he would be responsible for what his students do within his project. And that means that if something goes wrong, you know, we're going to contact you, and we're going to give you, you know, hopefully work with you to resolve any issues. Um, uh, and it, for example, in a um, in an, undergr uh, in an undergraduate class example, the professor would be the project lead, um, and he would have graduate students um, who assisted him, and then the, member the students in the class would be members of the project. Um, in addition, um, the, um, the experiments are represented here on the picture by slices, um, which we're going to define, um, a term we're going to define in a minute. But um, you should sort of think of it as the resources and the experiments that you're running um, in Genie. All right, so a little bit about where projects come from. Um, so basically, only somebody with the project lead permission can create projects. And um, there's a button on the portal to request that. But it's generally, we will only approve that request for people who are sort of professors or senior members of a company, because um, it's a very important responsibility. Um, when they create a project, that project name is public. Anyone can see it. It's unique. It can, there can only be a project, 
one project with that name, and it's permanent. You can't delete the project, you can disable it, but it will always be there, so you can't reuse that project name later. Um, and then a project can contain many experimenters, and an experimenter can be a member of many projects. So somebody who's a project lead might have one project for the research that he's doing and a different project um, for the students in an um, undergraduate class that he's teaching, and he can sort of keep those pieces separate, but he'd still have responsibility for both. In addition, projects have an optional expiration, which is useful for um, classes and tutorials. So for example, we're all gonna be members of the GEC 17 project, because we're at GEC 17, and that project expires in a couple of weeks, um, because um, GEC 17 is a limited thing, right? And so you would go and you would create your own project. All right, so that's sort of what, pro how pro what projects are. All right, so let's um, jump in and start um, working on the tutorial itself. So we're gonna work on part one, and we're gonna do it in a couple of pieces. Um, so a lot of this we've already done here. This is a lot of the one-time setup. So in general, you would design your experiment because it's a tutorial, we've already done that for you. Then, um, You've all created Genie accounts before coming into the room, so that's great. And then um, we're going to uh, add you to a project. Many of you are probably already added to that project, but not all of you. In a second, we're gonna, if you wanna go ahead and log in um, and see if you see um, GC17 listed under projects, that's great. If you don't see yourself, well, I'll walk you through doing that in a minute if you don't know how. Um, uh, if you don't see that listed, go ahead and raise your hand and um, we'll help you straighten that out. All right, good. And then the final thing we're gonna do is um, some one-time setup of generating and downloading SSH key pairs. <coughs> All right. So the Genie portal is a portal.genie.net. Um, if you want to go try logging in right now, you can go do that. Um, basically, just a little bit of background. Um, this is largely for people who might teach classes or do research at a school. Basically, anyone with an account at a supported identity provider can log in. So what does that mean? A supported identity provider um, is somebody who's um, a member of... Wait, I'll explain that in a second. Sorry. Um, basically, if you don't have an account at a supported identity provider, we can make you one. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to get an account. Um, but the basic notion is anyone can log into the portal, um, but you have to be a member of a project to do anything interesting, right? So that's the thing. Projects are what give you, or give you the power to do interesting things. So how do you have um, an account? Most of you already know this. Um, there's sort of two ways. Um, we're if, uh, uh, the portal is a tool that's um, trusted by um, members of the Incommon institution. And so there's a lot of universities that if you have an account for, say, checking out books of the library, <coughs> um, you can use that same account um, to log into the portal. And so that means if you're running a class full of undergraduates and you're at one of these supported institutions, you can have them just all log in and join your project. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's no fiddling with accounts, which is really nice. That means we never see your passwords. We don't have to deal with password management. That means experimenters don't have to learn a new password. If you're not a member of an incumbent institution, we're happy to create you an account at our IDP. And, um, and that's not a problem, um, but it's probably a little less convenient. So, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm really dry. All right. So that's how you log in. Then there's a couple of things I wanna talk about real quick um, that uh, are the first couple of things that people tend to get tripped up by. The first one is that um, compute resources in Genie are always accessed via SSH using public-private um, key pairs. The way that works is that you generate um, a public-private key pair, it's using public um, key encryption, and um, you upload that public key and that gets um, uh, loaded onto resources for you, you keep the private key, and then when you um, SSH to log into the node, you're, you um, have the tool offer up that private key and it logs you in to resources. There's a number of different ways to, um, to uh, uh, offer up the private key. Um, 
uh, you can ask me more about that later if you've never done that, that's fine. But the important thing is there's no password to log into resources. And if you ever are prompted for a password to log into a compute resource in Genie, that means something has gone wrong. That means you aren't offering up the private key. It means your public key didn't get loaded on due to some sort of software error. That means that it's always, if you're asking yourself, what is my password to log into this machine? That means something's gone wrong. So that's sort of just a simple thing. The second um, thing that I wanted to make sure to mention that's really, really important is that because these resources are free, you can't have them forever, right? Because maybe you wandered off and you're not using them anymore. So we have a concept of expiration. First, a project has an optional expiration time. It's not required. Um, um, then the slices that are within that project have their own expiration time, and that expiration time can't be any later than the project's expiration time. If your project doesn't have expiration time, then that doesn't matter. Then when you reserve an individual resource, that resource reserve has an expiration time, or that reservation has an expiration time, which is, again, bounded by the slice, slice's expiration time. And so you can have multiple resources at different aggregates that have different expiration times, but they will all never be any later than the slice expiration time, which in turn won't ever be any later than the project's expiration time. And what that means is when you want to renew your resources, you need to be sure to reserve both your, um, to renew both the slice and the resource, uh, the resource reservation underneath it. And I'll show you how to do that in a second, but this is sort of the big picture concept behind that. Okay. All right, so let's get going. Fantastic. Oh, good. I did give myself a copy of the instructions. Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, we're, start, we're on page three of the instructions. They're numbered at the bottom. If you're, um, you should log into the portal via the browser on the VM. Um, there, there's nothing intrinsic about doing this exercise that's important to do in the VM, but it gives us all a common, um, common um, environment to do the, the tutorial so we don't have to deal with differences in SSH and things like that. Um, yes, you have a question? Have you given the password to log into the VM? That is an excellent question. It is GEC17 user, all lowercase. And I will write that down. That is a fantastic So I'm going to go log in to the portal. All right. OK, so you, when you go to portal.genie.net, there's this big Use Genie button, which you've all seen by now. Um, I'm going to log in to, um, with a Genie Project Office account. I'm using a temporary account right now so that we'll all sort of have the same experience.
Just a second. Um. Yeah, no, you had a successful failed login. Excellent. So step number one is always being able to log in. Okay, yes, user error and I'm incapable of typing my own password, which is fantastic. Exactly. All right. Okay, hopefully that's the worst thing that'll happen at this tutorial. Okay, so um, I'm logged in, and the first time you log in, it asks you to authorize the portal um, to act on your behalf, and it says that you agree to some policies. Basically, you know, be responsible. Um, and there's some notices about privacy, how we'll use your information. So you agree. Um, you activate your account. All right, and so I'm in. All right, so this is great. And, um, just flip back to the slides, which are nicely labeled, <coughs> and look, look terrible. That better. Okay. All right. So this is a picture of the home page, um, uh, and this has a few things that you'll use a lot. Across the top, um, it says where it says you are here is the home page, and that's where you do most of the day to day day to day activities in the portal. In addition, on the right, there's a profile button, which has some one time use features, which we'll use in a second. Um, and then there's a help tab, which has a few links to um, things that might be helpful for using the portal. Then down the left, you, um, at the top, you'll see your list of projects. And then um, you see your list of slices. The first time you log in, you'll probably um, see zero or one of those. Um, we've added people to the projects. And then below that, you'll see um, the log messages. Um, is, well, that's fine. Okay. Um, Good. So second, the second thing we're going to do is, um, <coughs> is we're, ah, good. All right, so we're logged in, and then um, we're going to join a project. So um, I have a new account, and so I haven't been added um, to any projects yet. Um, most of you should have been added. If you do not, if you see something that looks like this, um, and you don't see GDC 17 listed, you should follow along. What we're going to do is we're going to click join a project here. And then if you scroll down, um, you'll see a GEC 17 project owned by Nikki Riga, who's doing this exercise downstairs. And we're going to click join. And I'm going to say I'm attending GEC 17 tutorials. And I'm going to send a join request. Excellent. Okay. And so that's going to, uh, somebody has to go approve that join request by hand. Um, can, just so we know, is anybody, anybody here besides me have to, um, have to join a project? So there's like, uh, there's a handful. Okay. Can, um, I don't know if we were anxious in advance. Um, ben, can, are you able to approve join requests? Or you're doing it? Thank you. All right, so that's going to take a second, and we'll do that. We're going to talk some more um, while we do that. Um, and so uh, while, while we're waiting, we're going to go um, do, deal with our SSH keys for the first time. OK, so you're going to click on the profile page on the upper right. All right, so in general, you could generate your own SSH private key pair, but because this is a tutorial and we want to do this quickly, <laughs> we're going to have the portal do it for you. So there's this button. Can you guys see this? There's this button that says generate and download an SSH key pair. I'm going to click that. <coughs> Good. And it's going to ask you for a passphrase for your key. You're going to download this key, and you're going to be asked to enter this passphrase sometimes. So it's important to remember the passphrase. Use the same passphrase both times. And for it be something that you can reliably type unlike my temporary account password. So I'm going to enter a password, same password twice, and I'm going to click Generate SSH Private Key. We're on the top of page four if you want to sort of follow along 
so you get sort of behind. Okay, great. I do not want it to remember the password. Great, so I have my SSH key pairs generated, now I wanna download the private key. So it says private key, it says download private key, so I'm gonna click that button. It's gonna ask me if I wanna save it, which I do. All right, and so um, now it's downloaded. All right, and then um, on your local VM, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put that key some in a standard spot. We're gonna change the permissions on it so that it's not accessible to um, other people. And then the, the third line here um, is uh, one way of telling your SSH agent to offer up your private key when you SSH. Um, you're not required to use this for the tutorial, but I went ahead and put it in there in case you want to in a minute, um, so it'll already be set up for you. Okay. Um. <coughs> Oh, there's a second, let me, forgot to pull up a terminal. Okay. All right, so um, I just have this is just a terminal on my local um, local machine. You should be doing this within the VM. I'm going to type those three commands. So I'm just moving my key to the standard spot, which is the .ssh directory. Done. And then I'm going to change the permissions on it. Good, and then I'm gonna add it to my SSH agent, which is the tool that um, offers up my private key. And then I have to enter that passphrase that I entered when I generated the key. And it says that it added my identity, which is great. So we're done with that. So that's the middle of page four. Okay, um, so that's fine. Um, okay, so um, anybody have any questions with that? Need help with anything? Yeah. Uh, do I read and read the VM? You do not read and read the oh, VM. Cool. Um, what, do you, what operating system is that? Uh, Ubuntu. Ubuntu? That's fine. Okay. Just do it. Uh, that's why I put the SSH out of here, so you, you can do that and it'll be good to go. <coughs> All right, there's nothing really, really important about the VM here, yeah. but there's a user. <laughs> So the question was if it's important to use the VM. The VM isn't critical for this demo at all. It has some bookmarks in it, and it provides a common um, SSH environment. Um, it already has an SSH agent running if you want to use that, things like that. Um, you're not required to use it. If you have you know, a Linux box, um, a Mac book or Mac um, machine, anything like that, and you're comfortable with SSH, feel free to use that. That's just fine. All right, yep. So, um, back to some slides. Um, we're going to define a couple of more terms real quick. Um, the first one is resource, and it's just a piece of infrastructure um, that you use to do an experiment. Resources can be sort of real or virtual. So, um, 
An example is compute resources. You can get a full bare metal machine that's all to yourself, or you can get a virtual machine. And likewise, um, uh, you can get um, virtual network resources uh, like a VLAN or OpenFlow, and you can also get wireless resources um, like WiMAX. Um, and then um, resources in Genie are described with something called resource specifications. They're usually abbreviated RSpec, big R, big S. And, um, and those are just used to describe resources um, in a different, couple of different ways. So you'll hear that term a lot, and we'll use that term a lot um, just so you know what that is. It's just a file that says what resources um, do I have. Okay, the next term that you hear a lot is aggregate. Um, an aggregate is um, something that manages a reservable set of resources in Genie. So um, there's different kinds of that. Uh, you'll hear a lot about Genie racks. Um, there's OpenFlow aggregates. There's um, WiMAX aggregates. Um, today, we're using um, the Genie racks. Um, in general, the Genie racks include both compute resources and um, OpenFlow resources. And they include both bare metal machines and virtual machines. There's two different flavors, Instagenie and Exogenie. <coughs> Um, and uh, to, in this tutorial, um, this is the green dot tutorial, and everyone in this room is using, a, uh, we're going to use Instagenie resources. Um, the tutorial downstairs is using Exogenie resources. We're doing the same exercise, um, and there's very minor variations. Um, we're using the same set of instructions. Those in variations are noted in line. You'll see a little icon that has Instagenie or Exogenie. So we're the Instagenie room. Um, let me write that down. So, <clears throat> so what that means is in a couple of places in the instructions it will say if you have an Instagenie resource do X and you should do those things and if it says if you have an Exogenie resource do X, um, and you should not do those things. Um, the, the, the racks are intended to intentionally be different um, in important ways. So for example, the Instagenie racks are meant to be um, cheap, but there can be many of them because they're cheap, um, and, but they're less powerful as a result. The Exogenie racks are intended to be um, more powerful, but there's fewer of them, and so there's supposed to be these trade-offs. Um, if you want lots of knowns, you probably want um, Instagenie, uh, you want to use Instagenie. If you want a few very powerful nodes, you probably want um, Exogenie resources. All right. So those are that's what an aggregate is. And finally, there's slices. Slices is sort of the most fundamental um, concept in Genie, I think. Um, so a slice is just a container of resources used in your experiment. It's just a label or a bag, if you will. And so basically, um, a slice can contain resources from one or more aggregates. Um, and it belongs to a single project. So I create a project, I wanna run an experiment, I create this slice, which is just this, this bag or container, and I reserve resources and those resources belong in the slice. Um, and that's how I keep track of my resources for my experiment. That, the slices always have an expiration, which we talked about before, and that bounds how long you can have resources for. And then finally, it's important to understand some things about the slice names. There's a human readable name, um, and those na but those names, you should expect that they're public. Other people might see that name. So don't put, don't put something that you care about in the, the slice name. I don't know what that would be. Um, they're also, the slice names are reusable, but, they can, but there can only be one slice with a given name at a given point in time. So right now, I can create a slice um, a slice foo, and nobody else can create a slice foo. Um, but when that slice expires, I can make a new slice and I can call it foo. It'll be a different slice, but it'll have the same name. All right, so that's the slice. So just sort of let's put this all together. Um, we have a project. That project has a lead who is an experimenter who takes responsibility for what happens within that project. And then there's other experimenters who are members of the project. And when you when the experimenters want to sit down and do an experiment, they create one or they create a slice, and then they go out to aggregates and they reserve request resources, compute and network resources, um, which 
um, go in their um, slice, and that's how they get the resources to do their experiment. All right. Great. So now we're going to go in and we're going to do this. This is the, the w things we did before were sort of those one-time use, uh, one-time setup things. And now we're going to do some setup that's specific to our experiment today. So first, we're going to create a slice, which is a very simple operation. Um, I'm going to show you how to renew your slice. Um, it's, uh, you don't need to do that here. Um, you can if you want to. But um, renewing your slice at the beginning and periodically um, after you have the resources is important because um, if your resources or your slice expire when you weren't paying attention, you lose your resources and there is many an experimenter who has been sad. So if you renew it at the beginning, um, you, it can extend, it frequently will extend the um, uh, expiration of the resources underneath. And so you have a little bit longer, but it's still something you need to pay attention to. Next, we're going to reserve a couple of VMs. Um, that's supposed to say at one aggregate, and then um, we're going to then we're going to wait a little while while those VMs are booted. There's real work ha happening there, um, and we're going to see if they're ready to go. All right. So that's what we're doing next. Okay. So we need to go create a slice. Oh, we're on. This is the bottom of page four. We're on step 3.1, if you're following along. Also, the instructions, if you prefer an electronic form of the instructions, they're bookmarked in the VM, um, or the URL for each page um, is at the bottom. It spans several pages, but every page has the URL um, at the bottom there. All right. OK, so I'm going to go over. Um, so I'm, I'm currently on my profile page, but I'm now um, I'm going to go back to my home page. Excellent. So now, under my projects, there's um, there's a list of projects. My list has one item in it now, which is that GC17 project um, that I joined a few minutes ago. Is there anybody who does not see GC17 on this page? Awesome. Fantastic. OK. So um, I'm going to uh, click on that project. And I see this Create Slice button here at the top. Um, just real quick, I'll show you a little bit about this project page. It has actions, which in this case is the slice. It has some information about the slice and or about the project, like its name and its, ex and its expiration of the project. You can see it expires on August the 4th. And then it lists slices and project members, and there's um, all the people who are attending GEC on this project, so there's a lot of members. So I'm going to um, create slice. Good. And now, Did I drop my worksheet? Good. So your worksheet has um, the name of the slice on it. <coughs> and it should be something like iGenie 1 I, or iGenie 3 or something <coughs> like that. And that's the name you're going to enter here. Mine is iGenie02. You don't need to fill in the description, and you're going to click Create Slice. OK, so great. So it created a slice, and it's loaded the slice page. So Okay. Uh, no, I don't. I gave 
sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, would, would can you guys share? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay, can I have one? Yeah. Okay. Crazy to suggest that if we just went, I mean, these all appear to be in order, right? So I have ID 26, we've got the highest number, and then just like for all the folks who don't have a worksheet, just increment that. Okay, so Rob has blessed us to reserve more resources. <laughs> if you don't have a worksheet, but your neighbor has a worksheet, instead of saying um, the slices all are IG, IGNI followed by a number, um, if you don't have a worksheet, instead of the number, use your initials. So I would be IGNI SE. And that way, everybody, the, since the slices have to be unique, you can't reuse your neighbor's slice name. Um, but if you use your initials, that will guarantee that it's unique, all right? And then you can use the same aggregate. Um, you can use, I think, all the same information um, that's otherwise on the worksheet. Does that make sense? Is that okay? I'm looking at you. Does that make sense? Fantastic. Okay, so I don't have my own worksheet, so I'm gonna wing it. Sorry about that. Okay. Alrighty. So um good. So um where were we? Okay, so we created the slice. Um, now we're going to um, renew the slice. Good, um, so what I'm gonna do up in the right-hand corner is how um, you renew your slice. It tells me my slice currently expires on July the 28th, and I wanna just renew the slice, so I'm gonna click slice only. If I click the other thing, it's gonna go out and talk to all the aggregates in case I have resources there and try to reserve them, which takes a while, so we don't wanna do that right now. So I'm gonna reserve my slice. I cl click on the date and it pulls up this calendar. And so I'm just gonna extend my, uh, renew it for one more day just so we can see how it works. I click that new date. And so I'm renewing my slice for an extra day. I'm gonna click renew. And it tells me that my slice was renewed. That's great, and I'm gonna go back to the slice page. Fantastic, so that's just how to renew your slice. It's a very easy operation. It's worth doing, keep paying attention to. All right, so now um, we're gonna go uh, reserve resources um, using FLAC. So we start um, here on this, under tools, there's this button with a picture on it, and it says launch FLAC. So we're gonna click launch, and it's gonna pop open a new tab, 
and this is going to take a while um, while it sits there and tries to download Flack. And this will, so it starts doing some stuff. We see some things, but it's not loaded yet. Sorry, what? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Sorry, 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 sorry. All right. So right now, um, were you able to, do you find the flack button? Were you able to click that and launch it? So this is going to, um, this is going to take a minute. Um, and I'm just going to describe what you're going to see while this comes up. Okay. So everybody should be trying to launch and load flack. Um, so when it's ready, you'll have your username, which is in this green bar. You'll have your slice name. I'm using slice IG02, and that's here. And then when it's done, there will be a list in this white space in the middle that will list all the aggregates. So you'll see two lists of aggregates. There's the list on the left, and there's the list on the right. And then when it's really done, this spinning symbol at the top will stop. So we're just going to sit here for a minute and we're going to wait for this to come up. Did anybody not find the flack button? Anybody not able to launch flack? Let's see. All right, is that okay? Do you understand? You're waiting for it to come up. So, so take a second. All right. So we're now Oh, I found my worksheet. Excellent. All right, so we're um, waiting for that to come up. This will take a while. It probably takes a little bit longer because we're all doing it at the same time. So it might be a smidge quicker at home. Um, but you don't have to reload this real often, so that's fine. Um, we're on the top of page six of the instructions, if you're following <coughs> along. Um, I think it's handy to have the instructions out um, for some of these steps. So we'll do that. You. Flack is crabbing at me about SSH keys canceled. Did you regenerate your SSH key? I thought I did. Gary, can you? Gary's going to come help you straighten that out. All right. So um, my page has started loading, or finished loading. It gave me an error, but I don't actually think that's important. So I have my username on the left, I have my slice name at the top, and then I have a list of aggregates below. Um, are people starting to see something that looks like this? And can you even see it from the back? Victory, one person at least got it. Excellent. Okay. I want to make sure most people have this before we continue. We're about to do one very tiny cutie thing. Here is. All right. Anybody not have not see something that looks fundamentally like this? All right. I'm going to continue. Is that okay? Awesome. Okay. All right. So we're on page six, um, step number three. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find our, the worksheet at the top under step one lists an aggregate, right? So my aggregate is GPO Instagenie, and it tells me that it's sometimes known as instagenie.gpolab.bbn.com. Okay. So everybody see that, that aggregate listed on the top of their worksheet. So what we're trying to do is we're going to go find the row here that matches that. So I have instagenie.gpolab.bbn.com. It's a text that looks like code. And mine is the blue row here, right? So I, my instagenie.gpolab.bbn.com is this row. And this is the aggregate I'm going to reserve resources from. And so I, what I want to do is I want to reserve two VMs. So there's this VM button. And I'm going to click it once. And a, and a VM popped up on the screen, sort of in the lower right. And I'm going to click it a second time, so I get a second, second VM. It plots them in random spots on the page. Uh, is everybody able to find their aggregate from their worksheet in Flat? Can they map that up? No. no. Excellent. All right. It's under step one. It's under design. Oh, 
I'm going to move my little VMs a little on the map so they're easier to see from the back. Okay, so I've got my two VMs that I've drawn. Now I'm going to, you notice that if I mouse nearby one of them, it starts to draw a little line, right? So I'm going to roll over next to one of them, it starts to draw the line. I wait for that line to be drawn, then I click and hold. So click and hold, and then drag it towards the other one and it turns green, and I release and it draws a link and it says link on it. Does that make sense? So you sort of go nearby, click, hold, drag, go to the second thing, and release. This is possibly the trickiest part of the tutorial. So I just want to, this is the part that when I did it the first time, I was like, what? So anybody have, anybody have trouble with the drawing the link? Succeeded in the challenging part. Fantastic. It's downhill from here. Okay. All right. So uh, good. So now we're going. We're um, we're ready to start around the top of page seven. So there's this little eye icons on the two VMs. So click on. Um, the first one of those, and it pops up a page so you can edit some properties of that virtual machine. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to change the name so we can, um, VM and VM0 are kind of hard to keep straight, so we're going to change them to something um, easier to understand. Okay, so the first one I'm going to call client, and then, um, and then I want to set the IP addresses for it. Okay, so real quick, on the instructions, we're on step nine. We're labeling our VM as client. Step 10 is an exogeny specific step, so you don't need to do that. So you can skip step 10, because that's for the folks doing the exercise downstairs. Now we're on step 11, we're on page seven. So there's this link icon, it sort of looks like a couple of chain links here. We're gonna click on that, and it gives me all the interfaces on my compute node. So I'm going to click under IP, and what I want to do is I want to set the IP and the mask for my client. So on the worksheet, um, at near the bottom, I know it's under a separate step, um, it lists the client, and for under data interface, it says IP address, and it says something like 10.19.2.1, right? So I enter 10.19.2.1. And, um, and my mask is 255, 255, 255, 0. So this is a slash 24. 
All right, is everybody able to find that data interface um, here? This, uh, actually, let me pull up. I have a slide for this. Why aren't I using this slide? Okay. So we renewed, we launched Flack, we waited for some stuff. Um, oh, actually, I don't have, okay, hold it. Okay, here the worksheet looks kind of like this page, and you can see where it says the um, IP address, and it says 10.19.something minus 2.1, um, and so you want that IP address. All right, so I've set that and I'm gonna hit apply. And then now you wanna do the same thing for the other VM. So you click on the I. Was everybody able to set their name and IP and mask for their first VM? Getting there? Is it okay if I continue? Excellent. All right, so the second one is, we're gonna call it server. And it'll help if I spell it right. And we're gonna set the IP and mask again. And this time I'm gonna pick the IP address from the server side. So it's 10.19.2.2 .2 for me. You might have something slightly different. And then the mask is 255.255.255.0. And so I'm gonna hit apply. Okay, so now I have a client, a server, and, um, and they both have their IP um, addresses set. Is anybody having trouble with this portion? All these images are changeable after you click submit. Um, not really. Okay, I got two good questions and I'm going to answer them real quick. Okay, the first question was if I'm at home, how do I pick my IP address? There's two answers to that. Um, one, it sort of depends on the rack, okay? Um, I wrote these instructions to be the same for both Instagenie and Exogenie, and um, and so we had everybody set their IP address by hand. Instagenie will actually frequently give you an IP address um, for you. Um, we went ahead and had you set it so the instructions would be the same upstairs and downstairs. So you could take this home and do it on the other kind of rack if you wanted to and it would just work. Um, the second answer is um, all I've done here is I've picked some private IP addresses, uh, some addresses in private IP space and I've divvied them up. Right, so if you have a topology, you would pick IP addresses that were sort of appropriate for your topology, say in a private IP space, if that makes sense. And you had a second excellent question, what was it? Yeah, it's like uh, everything changes after you click the submit. Right, exactly. So right now, right now many, thing, whoa, many things um, aren't changeable after you click submit. That's some, a feature that we want and they're talking about that in the developer track downstairs. Um, for certain resources that may be possible, Gary could speak a little bit to that if he wanted to. Um, does Flock will allow you to update Instagenie resources? Is that true? Yes. So if you're using Instagenie resources, you can update some of these things via this interface. But that's not. But that's only true if for some of the aggregates listed here. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, which is why we were really talking to the developers and pushing them to fix this. Right, exactly. So he asked if he has a really big topology, he has to get it right in, in one go, and that's correct and why we're pushing the developers to, to fix this problem. So here's the thing. You are going to resource that can log into the VM, right? Yeah. Okay, and it's manually change the IP. Yes, and we're going to do that in a second. Okay. Excellent. 
Um, okay, so, all right, so now we have our topology. We've decided what our typology is, and now we're going to click Submit and Reserve Our Resources. So we're on the top of page 8 on step 16. And so there's this Submit button here at the bottom. And at the same time, um, it's probably fine. But uh, So I click Submit. It asks me, are you really sure? And I say yes. And so this is going to take a while. It's got to sit there, and it's got to go ask the aggregate to reserve your resources for you. Um, those resources then have to come up. And so what we're looking for is at, this is going to sit here and think, and after a while, the screen is going to turn green, all right? And the whole background will be green, like on the picture. Um, and this will take a little bit. So I'm going to sit here for a minute. Yep. Submitting, think so. Mine turned yellow because it's thinking, it's doing some work, it's still spinning, it's doing some things, it'll think for a while. We'll sit here for a minute. Yes, mine's yellow, but it's not spinning as quickly. Excellent. Okay, I think for me, the if yours is yellow and stopped spinning, there's this get status button here. Go ahead and click that. Matt? I'm not? Sorry. Hi. If yours is, if yours is yellow and it stopped spinning, um, there's this get status button here. You can click that again and ask it to, ask it to try again. Um, and it'll probably come up green here really quickly. Does that work, Matt? Excellent. Excellent. Greenness. Green is good. Green, yes. If it stopped, if it stopped and it's still yellow, this there's this get status button here. Push it, and it and it should try again. I think this is a very recent bug that showed up, so you can always push this button and ask it to try again. It's no harm, no foul. All right, I'm gonna let this sit here for a second while it thinks. Okay, mine mine did the same thing, so I'm gonna get get status. Well, that's not all slammed. Mine, mine took several minutes. I actually was working ahead of you. Uh, okay. So it might take a while. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep talking, then we're going to come back. Okay? So don't panic yet if it's not green. Um, we're all asking a lot of things to do a lot of work real quick. So, um, okay. So we've done this step. We set the IPs. Um, we reserved resources and we're waiting for it to be green. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the next step so that we're ready to go um, when everybody's green. Okay, so now we're on the meat of um, the exercise. I execute part of it. Um, and this is on a new page. This is starting on page nine. Um, okay, so what are we going to do here? Uh, we're going to log into our new two nodes after they're reserved, the two nodes, the client node and the server node. Then we're going to download and compile some experiment software. Um, then we're going to run the experiment. We're going to um, send a little bit of IP traffic to make sure everything's connected the way we think it is. Then we're going to remove the IP address um, from the interfaces and send some layer two traffic. Um, so then it's a very, very simple. This is, like I said, basically hello world. Um, and then we're going to log out of the nodes. All right. So um, a couple of things about this. One, the purpose of this exercise we're doing in part one is to intentionally do things the way you would out of the box, right? It's like I'm showing up, I'm gonna do things, and I'm gonna like, what do I wanna do on this node? What software do I want? I'm gonna sit there and I'm gonna compile it by hand. That's really annoying really fast with large topologies, and there's ways to automate that and make that easier, and part two of this tutorial is all about doing that. How do I do that at home? So um, if you sit here and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to type this another command by hand, we're not asking you to do that all the time. Um, if you find that painful, then you will really, really enjoy part two of the tutorial, which tells you how to not do that, all right? So I don't want to set the expectation. This is sort of 
this is the get in, try things as they come out of the box. And part two is like, how do I do this in a more sophisticated, repeatable way that I can do at home? Okay. Second thing is, let's talk a little bit about our very, very simple topology. We have our two VMs. We've got this client node and this server node. They're connected. Um, they each have two interfaces, right? Um, there, there's a data interface, which is where we're running our experiment. Um, that's where we send layer two, are going to send our layer two data. And then we also have a control interface on each node. And that control interface, um, it's uh, underneath the covers, it, it's connected to the internet. And that's the interface that I'm SSHing in on, right? And so they're sort of separate, and this is good, right? My control traffic is separate from my data traffic, right? But what this means is a minute when we're going to remove the IP address, you want to remove it off the data interface, your experimental interface. Otherwise, you will not be able to SSH into your node anymore. And that would be very, very bad, right? So it's just important to understand those two concepts. Each VM has two interfaces, a control interface and a data interface. OK. <coughs> All right, so now um, in a second, I'm going to go back and um, uh, see if my thing has turned green. And we're going to try to SSH in. And we're going to do that via the same little eye icon, um, except now when you click on the little eye, circle eye, there's going to be an SSH button. And we're going to use that button. All right, I'm still yellow. Oh, no. Yay, victory is mine. I have green. All right, anybody not have green? Still You're still yellow? Did you push that get status button? It's right here. That's fine. It's green. Fantastic. Anybody else not green? So here we are, and here's where we're going to SSH. OK, so uh, I clicked, sorry, I did that really fast. So I have my client node and my server node. And I'm going to click on the eye on my client node. And it pops up the same interface we saw before. And now there's this SSH button. So the, in, the, in the um, VMs, um, this is going to pop open an <coughs> SSH tool called um, Fire SSH, which is a JavaScript SSH plugin. Um, actually, I'll just do that real quick. So this is going to, it's in this, what happens after you click this button is sort of um, locally configurable. I could also have it um, set up to um, SSH um, on, um, through a terminal. If you don't want to use the Fire SSH, you can look here and under step 4.1, there's some fill in the blank SSH commands. And you can fill in the username, the host name, and then um, 
ignore the colon and the number after the colon is the port. So if you know enough to buy SSH to feel comfortable doing that, you could feel free to do that if you want to. Um, <coughs> and uh, speaking of which, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that and I'm actually doing that in a second because it'll be easier for people to be able to um, see what I'm doing. I'm worried that um, otherwise it will be very small. So, but I'll, just to show you how this works, I'm gonna click SSH, it pops open this second tab, and it's gonna ask me for a couple of things. It's gonna ask me for, um, I'm gonna start at the bottom, the private key is that private key you downloaded before, so I click browse, and it's gonna look in that .ssh folder, because it's the standard spot, and you click that ID Genie SSH RSA file. This is all in the instructions, this is step um, under step 4.1, on, it's on page 9, step 4.1, um, it's the bit under um, step 3. Um, so I select that private key file and I click open and then for the password, I enter the passphrase that I used when I generated the key. And I hit OK. And then, oh it's going to ask me should I add it to this key to the cache, it's the f standard security question, say yes. And now I'm logged in, right? So I can ls, so I'm in, right? But this is really, really hard to see. So I'm gonna go um, log in using, um, using a terminal so that um, people can see what I'm doing in a second. Um, okay. So um, I just did the same thing. Um, and so you can see that I'm logged in. And um, I'm logged in as ooh, user uh, GC17 user 41, which is my username, and I'm at the host client. Okay, so that was a lot really fast. Um, are people, were anybody able to log in to their first client? No. Anybody not able to? from the terminal, that's why I'm doing it. That's Um, so then I'm going to close that tab. I'm going to go click on the server node. I'm going to cl click the I again. It's the same thing. Um, there's the SSH information. And, um, and I'm going to um, copy down the login information so that I can log in in my terminal, which um, you don't have to do if you don't want. All right, so I'm...
Excellent. I will do it. Yes. Good. All right. So um, just so you guys can see, I have um, actually. Maybe I should. Sorry, I'm going to make this easier for people to see. So I'm um, trying to put this on here so we can see both terminals at the same time. So um, all right, so I have two terminals up, um, just so you guys can see it for the purposes of illustration, see them side by side. Um, and you can see that one of them says client and the other one says server. Okay, and so um, okay, good. So I have my two nodes and I'm logged in. And um, so now we're on step 4.2, and we're going to download and compile some experiment software. Here's a spot that if you have the, um, the, uh, the instructions open in the browser, it's really nice to copy and paste um, this wget um, command. So, but what we're going to do is we're going to do wget, which just um, goes out and fetches a file um, using HTTP. So we're going to download this um, zip file that has the software in it. We're going to untar it, or we're going to unzip it, um, and then, um, and then we're going to um, compile it. Um, notice, um, if you get ahead of me, um, on the top of page ten, um, there's a step. Step three is for only for exogeny guys. The apt gets and stuff you don't have to do, right? So um, you could, uh, and we need to do this in each terminal. So I'm going to do wget http colon colon. I should be copying and pasting this. I will regret this in a moment. I'm sorry the link is so long. All right, so um, a bunch of stuff just flew by, but it um, downloaded. You can see that it downloaded the stuff. Is this, can you guys? Guys in the back, can you see this text? Is this big enough? Is it too big? Is it okay if I make it a little smaller? Chaos, can you can you read this or is it? Okay. Is that still? Okay. Excellent. So we'll get a little bit more screen real estate here in a second. All right, um, so I did the um, the wget. Actually, I'm gonna just um, I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste that wget here in a second. So I did the wget. I'm now gonna untar the file. That's the tar xvfz, and I'm gonna use uh, tab complete to find the file. I just hit tab to fill that out, and I'm gonna untar that, and a bunch of stuff whizzes by. So it's untarred, and it untarred that. Um, into a ping plus directory. If I do ls, I have the original tar file, and I have this ping plus dash o2 directory. It's version o2 of the code. And so I'm going to um, cd into that directory. And then I'm going to just type make. It's just a little bitty C program, ran make. I'm good to go. I now have my software. Now I need to do the same commands in my other, on my other um, node, on my server node. So I'm going to do wget. Um, tar. I'm untarring. Change into that directory. Type make. Perfect. What? Oh, I'm sorry. It's I don't know why it keeps. Have you can you hear me at all? Oh, it's completely gone. That's no good. Hello. Hello. Hi. Should I push this button? Hello? Hello? I didn't touch it. It's not very sensitive. Off, on. 
Hello? Can anybody hear me? I'll go find maybe person. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm going to try to talk really, really loud, and hopefully I won't cough too much. OK, so um, we just installed the software on both places. So now we're ready, um, we're ready to continue. So we're, um, uh, let's see, let's recap real quick. Um, so we've logged in, just done, um, we've done all the steps under 4.2, we got the software, we, tar um, we decompressed it, we skipped the exogeny steps, and we compiled. Now, um, we need to do a special instogeny step, which is um, we want to run ifconfig, and we don't want to sit there and type um, slash bin slash ifconfig a thousand times, because it'll drive us nuts. Um, so we're going to set the path so that it has sbin in it. Um, and we're going to do that in both terminals. So the instructions sort of assume that you do that. OK? Um, OK, so unfortunately, in this shell, it's slightly messy. So this is under, <coughs> this is the very bottom of page 10. So we're setting the environment of pa path. And we're going to um, append uh, slash sbin onto the current um, path variable. Good. And so um, now um, let's, I'm going to copy and paste that into my other terminal. Great. OK. So now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to type ifconfig. Where's my, as soon as I find my terminal again, or my mouse. OK. So now I'm going to type ifconfig on a whole bunch of stuff just whizzed by. OK, so um, all right. So um, here we are. We're doing ifconfig. And it's really important at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to fill in this worksheet. This is really the reason we have the worksheet. Um, so there, I'm going to go stand in the middle of the room where people can hear me. So the worksheet hopefully looks Um, then uh, also on the server side, you're going to need the MAC address of the data interface, so you can go ahead and write that down. It might be listed as like HW adder or something like that. Um, if you have any question about reading my config, I'll pull up an example on um, my setup so you can see that. <coughs> so we're filling it in. And so really the thing here is we just don't want to make you have to start over and reserve your resources again, log in again, um, just because you lost uh, uh, your IP address. So here I am, and I'm going to, for a minute, I'm going to make this a little bigger. Um, OK, so if you look here, here, this is on my client known, and there's three interfaces. There's ETH 999, ETH 1957, and then there's loopback address, which is running off the bottom of the screen. And you notice that this second interface, this ETH 1957, it has IP address 10192.1. And that interface is, or the, that IP address is what I um, set my client IP address to when I started. So I know that that ETH 1957 is my data interface. So I'm going to write that on my worksheet. And I know that the other interface then must be my control interface. And so that's ETH. 999. So I wrote those down. So I know I've got ETH1957 is my data interface, and my control interface is ETH999. And then I'm going to do the same thing on my other nodes. So that I, if you can't see it here, I'm going to highlight. So right here, this IP address is my data 
Um, this is an IP address I configured for my data interface. And so I know that my data interface is ETH1957. And now um, I'm going to do the same thing on the server one. It's ever on IF config. And indeed, again, it's, uh, it happens that the interface is also known as ETH1957, and that has my other IP address, the 1019.2.2 here. Right? And so I'm going to fill that in. That's ETH1957. And I'm going to, and then I have this hardware address here on the upper right. That's my MAC address, my layer 2 um, address for um, this interface. And I'm going to fill that in on my worksheet as well. You can also copy and paste it when it comes time to do it. But. All right, good. So now I have my worksheet, and I filled out my worksheet. And this is important just so we do the next little bit right. Anybody need help reading IF config or writing down the worksheet? All right. Okay, good. So now we're going to go in and we're going to do a little bit of pinging. I'm going to put these back the way they were. Okay, so I still have my client node at the top and my server node at the bottom. All right, and so now we're on, we're on page 11 um, and we're just gonna ping, right? So I'm on my client node and I know that my server node is the one that ends in dot two. So I'm gonna just type ping, the IP address of my data interface on my server node, which I know is 10.19.2.2. Yours is going to be similar. It's the one that ends in dot two. And then uh, just for cleanliness here, I'm going to only have it, I'm going to have it ping three times real quick. Um, so it just stays on the screen. Boom, boom, boom. I, my three pings went through. So I know that um, my, I have data plane connectivity. I can do the same thing the other way if, um, if I want. Boom. So I'm able to ping. So this is just a little bit of sanity check. Do I have, are these, did everything come up right? Can I actually talk between these two machines? S boom, we're good to go. So that's the ping. Is anybody not able to ping? I know this is, you know, ping is the most basic thing ever, but. Three steps behind. You're three steps behind, okay. Okay, um, do you need any help? Do you need no, some no, help? It's okay good. Otherwise, yes. That's fine, I can get somebody to help if you need. Okay. All right, so we've pinged. So that's great. So we've, you know, woohoo, we've sent some layer three traffic, which I know is just really exciting because um, we've never done that before. Okay, so now we're going to do the non IP part. Okay, so we're at, um, hold it, let's. So we filled out the worksheet. Um, okay, and we've, um, we've done step 5.1, we've pinged. So the next thing we're going to do. Um, there's a step here that's exogeny specific, which we should skip the bit that says NUCA. Skip right past that. It's in gray text on the slide. You don't need to do that. That's an exogeny specific step um, that's specific to their configuration. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to take that data interface and we're going to um, remove the IP address by setting it to 0.0.0. .0, .0. And so that's the right. So I'm just. Um, going to do sudo if config. My, uh, I know that my data interface on my worksheet is ETH1957. This is the part that you really want to get right because there will be sadness. And I set the IP to 0 .0 .0 .0. 0. Um Good. And so I, easy peasy. And if I go back and I want to for grins, I can run IF config and I can look and I see my ETH1957 doesn't have an IP address anymore.
So it says destination host unreachable. It's unable to reach. We've actually not using IP at the moment. All right? No, I'm pinging the data interface. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Do you want me to? Well, no, I, 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 just a different question. Sure. So if config is part of the Linux distro. Yeah, 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 yeah. So is the reason that we couldn't get to it initially before we downloaded pin plug because the environment variables were? Oh, no, no. Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. When you, VM, when you, when you go out and request a slice that has VMs in it, uh -huh. uh, you're going to be prevented from accessing a lot of the things that you would normally access in a Linux distro or things like that? No, you shouldn't be. So what we did here is we used a default image, and that default image is nothing special. I think in particular it may even be really, really old. Um, it just happened to not have the S bin set in the path, and that's why there was that step in there. You should have been able to ping before we removed the IP address. Couldn't look at it. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Got it, got it. Oh, I see, I see. Oh, that's fine. Fine, fine, fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there's, so you can create your own image. We're happening, we, we're you, here because it's the intro tutorial, we're using the default image, right? But there's, you can make your own images, um, so you can set it up whatever way you want to. What is the, is there a, a limit to the, the type of VM that you can request? That's there is a little bit, and is Rob still here? Um, there, right now, um, you get different things from different aggregates, right? And that's one of the, that's, that's not a bad thing, right? That's um, different aggregates make different things available to you, and so that's sort of a strength. Can traditionally, um, Instagini has provided containers, not full VMs, but that has just recently changed, and they're moving um, to Zen VMs, I believe. And I'm going to make Rob talk about... Rob! Rob! <laughs> Rob Ritchie. Gary, or Gary, would somebody, would you like to say something about the types of VMs that you can do, use at Instagenie Racks? Yeah, you bet. So, um, so on the Instagenie Racks, there are three, um, uh, there are three possible things you can ask for. Uh, you can ask for a raw, bare metal machine, um, because Sarah mentioned earlier on that uh, the kind of the design in the Instagenie Racks, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of stuff in each one, so there's only a little bit of bare metal. There's only one or two bare metal uh, machines available in each rack, but there, there's that. Um, you can also ask for OpenVZ containers, which are not a true VM, but they all share one Linux kernel, and uh, uh, um, but you get something that looks fairly private, and that's actually what we're using today because they're extremely lightweight. Um, and we also have um, support as well for uh, asking for Zen virtual machines. So if you want to, you know, run your, uh, uh, if you want to really be able to run your own complete operating system, but don't need a very metal machine. Um, and then, in addition to to those, you know, we also there are also a bunch of very large clusters like um, a 600 node cluster at Utah. That if you want like bare metal, that's a better place to ask for it because um, you because that, that you're much more likely to be able to get it. Did that answer the question? Uh, well, yeah, I just also yeah. wonder about. So let's say you deploy this in a class. Yeah. And you say, well, geez, it'd be great to do a whole bunch of testing on Windows 8 because it's coming out. But how do you yep. run? Don't you run into licensing issues? Yeah. So we have Windows 7 images. We don't have Windows 8 images. But uh, uh, um, and because of licensing issues, those are only currently available at the Utah um, uh, at the at the at the, the rack that's in Utah and the and the big prototyping cluster that are in Utah. Um, so we have. Default images for Fedora, Ubuntu, um, uh, FreeBSD, and Windows 7. Um, it is difficult but not impossible to create your own image from scratch. Uh, I believe it's actually easier in the Exogeny to create an image from scratch if you want something other than one of those four. All right, so let me ask um, one more question. Yeah, please. So we do a lot of security testing. Mm -hmm. So it, sometimes it's fun to play with patched and unpatched OS yep. versions. 
and whether that and that might be the base OS or it might be an application that's running. Yep. So are are those available, or that would be something that you say, well, it'd be great if we uploaded this VM. I mean, other folks might want to play with it too. Right. So we have. So my yeah. So my general suggestion would be we have a couple of different versions of each of those operating systems, and we don't always do a great job of patching them. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, so, you know, my suggestion would be if, if you want to use like one of those distributions that I just mentioned is you can make your own VM image. So you can take, you know, our, you could go back to our Ubuntu 10.04 image, right? And then if that, you know, doesn't have some patches and you want to update that to 10.10 .10 and because it has some patches, you can make an image of that. Um, uh, uh, or I don't know. I've never tried. Da I've never tried downgrading anyone else's OSs, so I don't know how easy that would be. Um, but uh, uh, um, but in general, you know, we provide some default images. The idea is you can get stuff set up the way you want. Take a snapshot of that VM image, and then it will run actually on any one of the instances. Um, um, and I'm yeah. sure Rob's right that the XOGN rack. I think they talk about it being a bring your own image. So they're in, they're they they uh, they provide one default image, but their in, their um, intention is that you bring your own. So if you found that the right thing for you to do was to build two images that unpatched and a patched version, you could publicly make those upload upload those um, and easily use those um, as exogeny resources. And that's that's how they're envisioning their resources being used. I'm not saying you can't do that at Instagini, but it's possible that that's that that's an interest. It's an interesting question if if that's what you're interested in doing, which rack is um, more appropriate for you, and so you might talk to um, those and guys. For specifically for security and patched versus unpatched stuff. So the um, uh, with the Instagini racks, if you ask your virtual machine by default, you may have noticed that the control network was actually a private address. It was probably 172.16 or 172.17. Um, you can actually ask for IP addresses and it's an allocatable resource. So if you if what you wanted to do was run something that isn't going to have any incoming connection because it's, un because it's unpatched, doing exactly as we did for this tutorial and not asking for it to have public IP addresses is probably the right thing to do. Um, but if for some reason you do want some to have public IP addresses because you're going to run a web server that you're going to have the class connect to, or you know you want to you want to run something that has more meaningful interaction with that, the outside world. That's also in Flack. There's actually a, a checkbox on the node page that says, "Please give me that public IP address." All right, I think we're running a little behind, and so we're going to really quick. We're like five minutes from being done here. Um, thank you for the questions, though. I love it. I love when we get good questions. So, um, so that ping plus tool that we downloaded is basically like a, a layer two ping, if you will, right? And so um, um, in much the same way as ping has to run, be running a server, we're going to run something called ping plus listener. And we're going to fill in a, um, an ether type field, um, which is listed on the bottom of your worksheet. Mine's 19002. You might have something slightly different. Um, you're going to run that on the server node. And then on the client node, you run um, ping plus with the MAC address um, from your server data interface, which you filled in on your worksheet, um, your client's um, it, uh, interface name, which luckily, at least for my case, is the same both places, and then that same ether type you put the other place. And what that's going to do is it's just going to send a message um, to, the other, to the server, and it's going to get a reply back. Um, so I'll do that real quick. So on my server side, um, I'm just going to do um, sudo. I'm going to um, sorry. So I'm running ping plus listener and my ether type from my worksheet is 19002. And so I'm going to click, I hit that and it doesn't do anything because it's just sitting there listening, waiting for me to send it some, some data. So then on the client side, I'm going to um, do sudo. I got to give it the full path to ping plus. And um, I'm going to copy that, uh, put in that server MAC address. Um, 
um, my uh, client interface, which in my case is ETH1957. And then um, that same ether type, 1902. And it gave me two lines. It's, it, and you see that um, similar stuff on both the sender and the receiver. So it sent a message and it got something back. So it's just sent two lines. It sent one thing, it got a back, something back. Sent two things, I can hit this over and over again. So it's just sending a little bit of layer two data with no IP address. Very, very simple, very rudimentary. Again, this is just meant to be hello world and do something quick and easy. Um, so that's it, you've run layer two stuff, that's it. And um, so you can log out of your nodes and then the final step is just to go back to Flack and hit the delete button. And it's gonna you click delete and ask it to um, uh, delete the resources for you. Might wanna log out of your nodes real quick. <coughs> so I'm gonna, um, so just in case people wanna go to lunch, I'm gonna just show you um, real quick how this works. Um, back in Flack to delete, um, you hit this delete button. It's gonna ask delete at used managers or delete everywhere. Just say delete at used managers. And it's gonna say, do you really want to deallocate all resources in the slice? I'm gonna click yes. And it's gonna sit there and it's gonna think for a little while and eventually um, it'll turn red. So I just don't wanna like keep people too long. Um, so um, wait, I also have some, I have like two things to say at the end. Um, all right, so uh, the deletion is part of finishing up. Usually, um, if you're running an experiment, you'll have some data you'd want to archive. You would do that now. Um, and then you're just cleaning up because um, if you're using the resources, nobody else can. Um, and so if you're done with it, you should delete it. Um, I just showed you how to do. And so that's it. Um, we've done the three things we set out to do. We've run a very simple Genie experiment. We've learned and exercised some Genie terminology. And we've used two full Two, two tools, the Genie Portal and Flack. Um, what else should you do? Um, if you are using a temp account, um, I'm not sure if anyone is, you should request a permanent one. If you're a professor or PI type, senior member of a technical company, you can ask to be a project lead so that you can create projects. You can ask your students to join your project. If you're a student and your professor is not here, go pester them, ask them to create a, an account. Um, and uh, get project lead and make a project and you can join their project. Um, and then, uh, so in a, um, when you come back from lunch in part two, um, we're gonna talk about how to automate some of this process so you don't have to do this w get and compile every time. We're gonna talk about how to um, sort of automate that. We're gonna talk about what's happening a little bit behind the covers, what are we really doing? Um, and we're gonna talk, we're gonna have a brief talk on um, the differences, or differences, the strengths of the different types of racks. So if you have a question like, oh, I really wanna do X, which one should I pick? We're gonna try to help answer that. And then um, in part three, we're gonna, uh, it's going to um, use some instrumentation and measurement tools so you can say graph data in your experiment. And then there's additional tutorials later on. And um, in particular, if you have any questions or you wanna start your own experiment, you want help from me or Nikki or others, there's an experimenter dropper in session tomorrow afternoon. And there's a coding sprint um, on Tuesday afternoon. So you can come to either of those and ask all the one-on-one -on -one questions that you want. And that's it. But do please delete before you go. Um, we appreciate it. So will the, um, all right, I think that's, I think that's it. Uh, just say at the used aggregates, it's fine. It'll be quicker. But thank you. And thank you for thank you for using Genie and coming and happy to answer any questions.